This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. When I started this show, I wanted it to be unlike any other. I wanted to talk with people about big ideas, but also about themselves in ways they never had before in public. So far, that's exactly what's happened in every episode. But I couldn't have that kind of conversation by talking to someone on Skype or on the phone. They have to be talking to me face-to-face in person. And that means I have to travel and find recording spaces where I can have intimate conversations like that. All of which is to say, I need your help to keep this show going. Please do me a favor. Go to unregisteredlisteners.com and become a subscriber. This isn't just a contribution. You'll become a member of a private Facebook group where you can talk with me and with guests from the show. You'll also receive access to the episodes that have been archived, which right now include the episodes with Michael Malice, Maggie McNeil, and Camille Foster. We're also rolling out unregistered merchandise, shirts, mugs, stickers, and other items featuring the unregistered and Renegade University artwork. Subscribers get free or heavily discounted merchandise there. There's much more for subscribers at unregisteredlisteners.com. I hope you can help me keep these remarkable conversations going. There's another way you can participate in conversations with me like the ones on the podcast, and it's happening soon. There are a few tickets left for a special weekend event with me in Salem, Massachusetts on August 5th and 6th. During the weekend, we'll discuss many of the issues that I've talked about on the podcast, including the meaning of the Trump presidency, the current crises in colleges and universities, the politics of race, and the idea and theories that inform my work. And during the weekend, we will record a live episode of Unregistered. You can get all the information for this event and purchase tickets by going to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. My guest this week is someone I've admired for quite a while. Connor Friedersdorf is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he focuses on politics and national affairs. And he's everything I think a political journalist should be. He's intellectually curious and rigorous. And maybe best of all, he defies political categorization. Connor can never be accused of being a shill for either the Democrats or the Republicans. In fact, he's always asking questions they don't want asked. So there are very few academics who can write for a popular audience and do it well. There are very few journalists who write for popular audiences who have the rigor and the intellectual curiosity of academics. And there are just very, very few people who can do both those things, who can combine the intellectual rigor of academia with accessible writing of journalism. And uh, one of those special people is right in front of me. And I've been a big fan of his for a long time, Connor Friedersdorf. When I started thinking about doing this podcast, I just told him, off air, I started thinking in my mind who who I'd like to have on the show, and his name came immediately to mind. And so I searched and searched his uh, biography, and I found out that he lived very close to where I was. He lives in Venice, California. And so I'm very pleased that he is here with me today, and I can't wait to talk to him about all manner of things. So Connor, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. um, So here's one thing I'll say about you. Um, I think you may have written the most important article of the last year and a half on politics. I mean this in in, in regards to Trump in particular. When people ask me, well, what do I think about Trump? I say, go read Connor Friedersdorf's article on the imperial presidency in the Atlantic. 
in May of 2016, this is long before Trump was elected. This was when most people thought he would never be elected. It lays out beautifully, and actually you'd written several other articles in the same vein in previous years. It lays out very well why we should fear any president, really. And, but more importantly, it argues that rather than worry about the, the character of the people who might be elected, we should worry about reducing the, their, their power over us, the power that they would wield once they are elected. I just think it's the most important thing. I mean, I, the, the thing that I was on election night, I was very, very nervous, not because I thought there would be rampaging mobs of white supremacists in the streets, but I thought, my God, this man has his finger on the button and he could go to war at any second. And I don't know. I just don't know what he thinks about foreign policy, if anything. And that was really terrifying. So I spent that whole election night because, of course, like everyone else, I didn't expect him to win. I spent that whole election night researching all of his foreign policy people and all their thoughts. And I got a little bit calm by the end of that because I realized that there was a strong non-interventionist strain among them, although they still wanted to bomb the shit out of the Middle East. But anyway, nonetheless, war is the worst thing to me. That is really my primary political passion is stopping this country or any country or the world I live in from going to war. You know, I think World War II was the worst thing that happened in human history. I think many wars of the 20th century followed right behind in terms of being the worst things ever. It's what scares me the most. And I'm actually, I think, unusual in that way, which is also quite depressing. I think it's a small minority of Americans who care much about it, war. It is depressing. Yeah, isn't and, it? And odd. It's, if you look to history, it's clear that going to the wrong war is one of the most catastrophic things that a superpower can do. If you think about even recent American history, you have these periods after World War I and right after Vietnam where there was a sort of consciousness of, oh, wow, if we do one of these things unnecessarily, the consequences are literally a generation of our sons being decimated, uh, or maybe not quite decimated, but uh, significant numbers of young people just going away and never coming home. And, and after a conflict like World War II, at least you could think to yourself, I see what this was in service of. Uh, after World War I, after the Vietnam War, it was really hard to see that. And for some reason, even though there's been a backlash uh, after the Iraq War to candidates who supported it, I think that's a big part of why Barack Obama was able to beat Hillary Clinton, and I think that it's a big reason why he beat John McCain. Uh, I think it's part of the reason why Trump won, actually. I, I, there still doesn't seem to be any recognition of just how catastrophic it was and uh, that the thing we really ought to avoid is doing something like that again. Because if, if you talk in terms of American blood spilled, innocent people overseas, even if you just talk in terms of the amount of uh, the amount of money that we spend, the opportunity cost for the military, it, it's pretty difficult to look at anything that happened in the post uh, post-millennium era and, and see any policy as catastrophic as the Iraq war, as far as I'm concerned. So you would think that that would have prevented Hillary Clinton from rising again and, and winning the nomination. Someone as hawkish as her that has had so many, um, who, who doesn't seem to have learned the lessons of Iraq. You know, you, you saw her kind of push for intervention in Libya, for example, and now you have a destabilized country that ISIS has gotten a presence in. And it's just confounding to me that the this is, I guess, the only part of Trumpism that I'm at all sympathetic to is this idea that foreign policy elites have just been wrong again and again and have not learned the lessons from it. Uh, weirdly, I don't think that Trump has learned the lessons from it either. And I wrote a piece actually uh, talking about how Trump is much more hawkish than people think. You can even, as recently as the Libya intervention, see a video of him sitting at his desk in Trump Tower saying, we need to go in and get rid of Gaddafi. Hmm. Um, but I share your view that I wish more Americans would put not fighting dumb wars at the top of their list of policies to avoid. Yeah, so you know, I've been thinking about this recently because I'm actually writing a book on the history of American foreign policy. And um, 
it's pretty clear to me that certainly for the wars of the 20th and 21st centuries, now a solid majority of historians and pretty much anyone who's thought seriously about them view all of the wars except for World War II mm -hmm. as either unjust or unnecessary catastrophes. And I am finding in my research on World War II that there is a growing, I don't know if it's a consensus, but I think it's close, getting close to a majority of prominent historians in Europe now argue that World War II was unnecessary, that military intervention against the Nazi regime produced more bloodshed than if there hadn't been intervention. This, of course, is a very long argument to be had. We don't have to get into it. But but even if World War II was the just war or the good war, as it's often portrayed, current estimates by historians are that it cost between 60 and 80 million lives. I always tell this to my students when I get to the narrative in the lecture about World War II. You know, let's start there. Let's start with the number of people dead, 60 to 80 million people dead. It's a number that's so big, you can't make any sense of it. How many football stadiums full of people is that? I don't even know, but it's many, many, many. It, it is many large cities all put together. It's astonishing to think about that. And yeah, it's, it's never really dealt with. The numbers, the, just the, the, the loss, the catastrophes for so many people. But then certainly World War I, all the little wars in the Central America in the 1910s and 20s and 30s, Korea, the one we never talk about, immense losses on both sides. For what exactly? And then Vietnam, you know, estimates now are maybe 2 million Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians were killed and 50,000 Americans, right? And then all the CIA wars in Iraq, in Iran, in Guatemala, et cetera, in Central America, and then, of course, Iraq. How many people support any of those interventions and think they were good things other than Samantha Power and Michael Lind and a handful of either neocons or neoliberals? Yeah, so then we get to Iraq and, hey, let's do it all over again, guys. And now we have just abundant evidence, as you were saying, that it caused nothing but worse things in that region. So Stephen Miller. Okay, Trump's main foreign policy advisor, as far as I understand it, who grew up not far from where we're sitting, went to Santa Monica High School, interesting guy, he's like 31 or something like that. He's the one who made me think there was a chance that we could break this long tradition of not just interventionism, but regime change interventionism, right? Uh, because he was very clear about that. He's clearly against that. He's clearly against, in his public statements at least, the United States attempting to remake the world in its own image. And he said this a lot. So that's why I had, had hope. And Bannon too, I think. Again, they wanted to wipe out uh, radical Islam with bombs in the Middle East, which I knew was going to be a catastrophe as well. But at least I, it seemed to me they didn't want to go in and try to remake the world in our image anymore. Now that seems to have gone by the wayside since Bannon and Miller seem to have been demoted, essentially, and the generals have taken over. And we're back to sort of, it seems to me, like a, the standard foreign policy. I, you know, I never had much much faith in Bannon, partly because he, in addition to, my impression was, was first that he wanted to kind of go in and, and carpet bomb Syria. Uh, beyond that, he would, would speak repeatedly about the inevitability of a war with China and suggesting yes. that we ought <laughs> to true. strike them before, uh, and that terrifies me. Yeah. even more than Hillary yeah, Clinton yeah, wanting yeah, to yeah. go into Syria and risk conflict with I, Russia. I neglected to mention that there was, a, yeah, I, I heard someone mentioned this, that, that Bannon and Miller had this thing about China. And I, you didn't really see much of it, though, in the campaign. But then I found sometime during the campaign, or maybe just after the election, an article written in one of the major foreign policy magazines by two Trump people who were sort of academics, sketching out this long war with China, basically, you know, uh, major ramping up of the Navy in the Pacific and, you know, aggressive actions and forward deployment of the Navy in the Pacific, which sounded a whole lot like, by the way, Roosevelt's policy toward Japan in the 1930s, you know, basically forcing war, uh, but this time with China. And then I said, oh, gosh, this is really, <laughs> this is terrifying. So it's true. I mean, <laughs> it was unclear, though, that they wanted war. It, it was very clear that they wanted containment, but a heavily armed containment, you know, uh, which would require, as he said during the campaign, you know, many, many more battleships and cruisers and destroyers. Yeah. The, the frustrating thing to me, I think, 
a lot of these issues, um, I, th I think, can be pretty thorny. When I think even about a war with an ending as mixed as the Korean War, um, I understand how people can point to South Korea today and North Korea today and say, well, uh, we, we fought for half of the country and it was worth the lives to have South Korea and all the generations of South Koreans live that life instead of the interminable uh, awfulness of totalitarian North Korea for all of these years, right? Um, and certainly I, I think that World War II was well fought. I'm not familiar with the arguments that you're talking about. I'm happy to look at anything. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's kind of my judgment that uh, fighting the Nazis, fighting against the slave state of the Confederacy in the Civil War, despite the horrific loss of lives, which I think are glossed over sometimes, um, I think that those were just causes. And I understand how people can look at other dictators uh, who repress their people and think um, we need to do something about this. What I get frustrated by is looking at a war like Iraq, like many other failed interventions, like Vietnam, where there were uh, bad elements of the enemy, and not appreciating the inability to plan very far ahead in war, that things are always going to go wrong, and that there's a very good chance that even with the best of intentions, you could bring about consequences that turn out to be much, much worse. And so when I look at a conflict like the one in Syria, and I see people like Hillary Clinton and John McCain, where they're not saying, well, we've been forced into war, it's a last resort, or we're going to lose an American city. They're not saying, um, you know, the future of civilization is at stake here. They're saying, well, if only we would have stepped in in this brief window in 2012 or 2013, and we would have backed this one rebel coalition that is kind of in bed with this other coalition that we don't like, but they're all against the regime that we don't like, and maybe some of the weapons will go to ISIS, but maybe... It, it just seems like even very simple plans go wrong in war. The idea that you're going to have these very extravagant, complicated plans that only the most sophisticated experts w would understand, uh, it, it drives me crazy that so much of the foreign policy establishment remains in thrall to these very uh, complicated bank shots, right? You imagine playing pool with these people and every shot is around the back and off of two rails and like, mm -hmm. you know, then the eight ball is going to jump over a ball, another ball that's in front of the pocket and make it. And and I, I, I really don't understand um, their faith in themselves to make these kinds of judgments huh. given how many times they've failed. The, uh -huh. the particular people they've seen before, yeah. what they thought would be uh, you know, consequences they clearly didn't foresee, and yet still uh, they attempt these kinds of shots. So the answer to your question there about why these people keep doing this, keep yeah. thinking this, that they, can, that they can solve the world's problems in these ways, I think is related to, or I think the answer can be found in your work on another issue, which is on academia and the politics, in particular, of the academic left, which you've written a lot about. Okay. So here's a question, Connor. Where do you think every, the, the idea for every war in American history came from? I don't know. Tell me what you think. Universities, professors, people either in employed by universities, actual professors, or people directly connected to universities, these think tanks like the Council for Foreign Relations. But, you know, these ideas to go to war in these far-flung places really have to come from intellectuals, right? You, they have to be aware of these places, first of all, and they have to know something about them to have this idea. And then, but more importantly, it comes from this idea that only intellectuals have, which is that they know how other people should live, right? I mean, it's, it's this weird thing because I'm an intellectual, I'm a professor, <laughs> uh, it's a, my world too. I study the world, I study people in the rest of the world, I study their lives. A few of us don't make claims about how other people should live, but it seems to be a thing among intellectuals that we know better how others should live. And in particular, I'd say intellectuals on the left, uh, progressives in particular, right? That's, they were the ones who knew how the poor were living and what the poor needed, and they were the ones who were going to save the poor. So that extended, so that logic extended in World War One 
to Europe. World War One, World War One is certainly the example that you that you would use to yeah. to prove this thesis. Uh, every, but every, Afghanistan every, and Iraq seem to cut against it, right? Oh no, no. Why? Well, keep. We, why, why would it cut against uh, it? You had pretty substantial uh, opposition on college campuses to both wars. Oh, I th- yeah. I think okay, if gotcha. you would have taken a poll yeah. of faculty uh, at major institutions, oh, sure. yeah. they would yeah, have yeah. been very against it. Right. Um, and you had popular support for mm-hmm. for Iraq uh, and overwhelming popular f- support for Afghanistan. You had, I think, only... Um, what was it one? It was only Barbara Lee, I think, that voted against the UMF for Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I think my my point was that Afghanistan and Iraq were progressive wars. It's that people who call themselves progressives weren't aware of that. <laughs> um, and so what I was saying was, wait, guys, why aren't you for this? Or at least some version of this. And here's why they weren't for it. The wrong guys were running it. If If the right guy, like an Obama, were running those wars, don't you think it would have been a very different story on college campuses about their support for? It would for be well, we know if this. Obama was president in. Well, in, in, in a sense, we sort of know this because he he had his own rampage over eight years in all over the world. You know, deployed special forces. He had he started wars. You know, they weren't declared wars by Congress, but they were wars. You know this. Mm-hmm. How many countries are there American troops on the ground killing people? You know, it's 20, 30, 40. I forget. It's some huge number. Most of those are Obama's wars. And what was the response by? our, you know, so-called social justice warriors, nothing, almost nothing. So they were cool with that because it's the right guy. Certainly drone strikes disappeared from the headlines and uh, all of these. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then there's other examples. If it's the right guy, we're willing to, the left and progressives are willing to kill all kinds of people. So here are other examples. Yeah. I think this points to war (laughs) as, as a, as a deeper (laughs) tribal impulse though. Right. And the, the thing that I um, well, can I just yeah, go finish ahead. That? please. <laughs> so the other examples are mm-hmm. Vietnam. That was all every every guy in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations who thought of that war, who directed that war, came straight out of where Harvard. <laughs> we know this. The best and the brightest. David Halberstam wrote a very famous book about this. But we know this. They were all intellectuals who came right out of the universities. They were all professors, and liberals and progressives. Every one of them. Korea, same thing, Truman administration. World War II, the escalation against Japan and Germany that preceded 1939, that led to the war in many ways. All those guys came out of Columbia, Roosevelt's brain trust. World War I, famously, also progressives, you know. John Dewey led the charge among professors for American entry into World War I. So, and the left, the hard left now, I will say this, the socialist left, generally speaking, opposed all of those wars. Okay, so that's a credit to them. Right. Again, I think they're a little confused, but that's okay. But certainly the pro- those who called themselves progressives or liberals in the 20th century, solid majority supported all those wars. So to me, what's going on in part is that progressives are kind of not sure about their own heritage these days, and I'm trying to educate them. <laughs> as to, <laughs> if you're really going to be a progressive you know, you should have a different position on things like the Afghanistan war where, hey, right, they're they're protecting women from these patriarchs, you know, and they're and they're teaching children who didn't have school books 10 years ago. You know, we're writing their textbooks literally in Afghanistan. You know, I, I do think that you're right that progressives don't have, uh, for the most part, a, a strong idea about their heritage, that it, it's almost as if the word liberal became um uncool. And so they seized on something else and progressive was the other thing kind of laying around. It's not to say that there aren't people who do know uh, the traditions and and embrace it. But uh, I I do think that progressive is just kind of the stand in word for, oh, I'm on the left uh, in in a way that liberal used to be that word. Mm -hmm. And it it was almost a successful maligning of liberal, not in the old sense, but uh, in the you're just the democratic coalition sense that I think that uh, liberal was very successfully maligned for a long time, and uh, from both the right and the kind of socialist left. And uh, so here we have progressive, and no one knows what it means. And yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a, and I think you've written about this. There's a, I think the word is arrogance that you're talking about here, right? That we know that if we send in this missile or that or that bomb or the 82nd Airborne this good thing will come of it. That was kind of what led much of the planning for Iraq, or at least the justification for Iraq, and certainly all the wars I just named. If we do this or that other thing, 
10,000 miles away across an ocean, a good thing will come from it. And here's what it will be. You know, in Vietnam, people in the Johnson administration said, we will have a new New Deal in the Vietnam. We'll have the TVA on the Mekong Delta was the famous line there. Same with Iraq. We're going to bring democracy to Iraq. There is an arrogance that's, I don't know if it's inherent in intellectualism, but it might be. <laughs> it's certainly the risk that intellectuals are always rubbing up against yeah. if, if they don't reread their Hayek every so often. <laughs> right. I mean, they're always, we, we are always, no, let me say it differently. Intellectuals often speak on behalf of others and they make claims on behalf of others. Because they're intellectuals, they make claims on behalf of people they've never met and never will meet, that they know only as abstractions or as numbers, which is quite remarkable if you think about it, right? That's very common among academics. Making claims about what unknown people, anonymous people need and even want. It's quite something. And it's something I guard against. And I, I, you know, we all have a tendency to do that. But to me, once you do that, once you start, once you go down that road, pretty soon the 82nd Airborne's following. Because if you, you know how people in Malaysia should live, and they're not living in the way that you think they should be living. Well, don't you have an obligation to do something about it? And the only way to do something about it is with a tank. <laughs> right? I, I am curious <laughs> about, the, there's so few countries that have been in the position of the United States in, in the post-war era uh, where the idea of extending the military this far overseas, whether for better or worse, with, with whatever motives, was even a possibility. Obviously, there have been other empires, you know, Genghis Khan riding across the steppes and, mm -hmm. and conquering huge swaths of the world. And, but uh, for, for a, a democratic people to kind of repeatedly vote to go very far abroad and to do these sorts of things, it's almost hard to find a lot of comparisons just because there aren't many countries that have been able to do it. And perhaps no country with our particular method of not quite old style colonialism, but also uh, not as disinterested and humanitarian as its biggest proponents would have you believe. And so, uh, I don't know, I, I'll just say it's both pretty far afield from my area of expertise in a code that I uh, will maybe never, never, uh, never successfully crack, but will continue trying to well, get people in these Washington think tanks to explain to me where does this confidence that you have come from? Well, keep asking the question. I mean, that's what I would say to you because you actually talk to these people, right? And Occasionally, I would, yeah. I would love it if you would just ask those questions. You know, how do you know? And why do you think you know what's best for people in this country that most Americans have never heard of? By the way, here's a question. It's an empirical question. What percentage of Americans do you think had heard of Syria before five years ago? I don't know. I want to say 15%. Yeah, I don't have the answer. I would bet it's Low. possibly single digits. <laughs> I mean, what is the percentage of Americans who don't know who the vice president is? It's something really astonishing. The number of Americans who can't identify Washington, D.C. on a map, it's some huge percentage. So Syria, knowing anything at all about that country? And then suddenly they wake up one morning and we, you and I, and the 50 of us who think about these things are talking about whether we should drop bombs on that country and kill people in that country. It's amazing, right? It, it's such an elite endeavor, foreign policy. Yeah, in the United and, States and, always has been. And I would argue that one of my hobby horses is that one check that we're missing that w that we were intended to have even before, I don't know if the founders ever imagined America being a superpower to the degree that it is now, but certainly long before we were anything even close to that, uh, the framers of the Constitution were saying going to war should be a decision that goes through Congress. And we have just given up on it, mm -hmm. uh, seemingly. I mean, we have an AUMF that covered the people who perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. Just spell it out, people who don't know. A I'm sorry, the authorization to use military force, which is the kind of modern equivalent of declaring war, uh, although some people would even say, no, that's not a declaration of war according to the Constitution. But for my purposes, if Congress authorizes the use of military force, that's as good as declaring war hmm. to me. Uh, unfortunately, we passed one after the September 11th terrorist attacks. It was broadly understood as, okay, we're going to go into Afghanistan and overthrow the Taliban and try and find Osama bin Laden. Barbara Lee, uh, the only person in Congress to vote against this, basically said, you guys want, might want to read the language here mm -hmm. a little bit more closely and think about all of the things that this could allow. And as it turns out, it has allowed military force beyond even what Barbara Lee anticipated, I think. Mm -hmm. And you could argue pro or con against any 
particular drone campaign or putting special forces anywhere on the ground. You could argue the merits of those things. But what I want to argue is that depriving the people of a congressional vote on these issues severs an important part of democracy. It means that when you go to the polls next time and you vote for your member of Congress or uh, the senators who represent your state, you can't look and see if they supported that war or that particular military action that turned out to be a great idea, and so you want to support them, or it turned out to be a terrible idea, and so you want to get someone with better judgment. You don't have the two sides of the political spectrum kind of butting heads and saying, well, okay, if we're going to do this, let's at least not do it in this really dumb way. Mm -hmm. You don't have that kind of, you don't have the debate, you don't have the democratic accountability that comes with it, you don't have members of Congress going on record in the way that is the main mechanism in a representative government for accountability. So I I would love to get back to voting on these things. Unfortunately, the incentive for the presidency is to assert as much power as possible. And Congress has just kind of ducked responsibility. They, if they just allow the president to do what he or she wants, suddenly uh, they don't have to stand up in front of voters at town halls and explain why they authorized putting American boots on the ground in Syria or you know, allying with the Saudis in Yemen or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So so what you're calling for is for Congress to have more control over foreign policy and for the president to have less. It, yes. And I think this speaks to the, the public ignorance question. If, if members of Congress were uh, debating this, I think there would at least be a little bit less, marginally less public ignorance uh, about these kinds of questions because there would be a debate and a vote about are we going to do X? Mm-hmm. So now I'm torn. I don't know what I want. Well, well, what I want, I know what I want. I want no war. Right. Um, so all I want really is whatever, whatever will keep us from doing things like sending bombs into other countries or, worst of all, American troops. You know, My son's 15, right, three years away from draft age, and I've been laughed at for suggesting that there's a possibility that the United States may have a draft mm-hmm. during the time when he's eligible, right? Uh, that's That's almost insulting to me, because if you look at the history of the United States, there have been many drafts called, sort of at the drop of a hat almost. People did not expect them at all in, you know, in every war. So I'm thinking right now, the fact that the vast majority of Americans don't know anything about the rest of the world might be good. If, if, if we gave them, gave them the power, they might be less likely to go to war against places they've never heard of. But then again, I don't know, because I've read, or, I've read Orwell, you know, and so East Asia, we can invent that concept in people's minds very quickly. And we, we know we've done that successfully. We, I mean, certain people have invented these evil regimes and villains to go fight against very successfully in the minds of Americans. I certainly don't want Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton with that power, mm. but I'm not sure I want the American people to have that power either. Well, it would be mediated again through <laughs> through their representatives. Uh, I, I personally think that that the public is at this point in American history almost always less hawkish than elites, and that this would lead to fewer wars. The other piece, if I were talking about a kind of structural reform that I think is both defensible on the merits and would lead to fewer wars, it's just pay as you go. If we're going to have a war, we're going to budget X amount of money for it, and taxes are immediately going to go up by X amount in order to pay for that expenditure. Mm -hmm. And I I think that that would force the mind onto how much this actually costs. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are really astronomical. I don't know. I mean, well, you know, I just gave that argument for, you know, how every war came out of the minds of intellectuals and academics, you know, and that's true. By the way, I didn't mention Iraq. Guess who the neoconservatives are? Sure. Right, <laughs> the idea for the Iraq invasion came out of the minds of professors. You know, Crystal and Wolfowitz and all those guys are all professors, basically. Historically, even when you make Americans pay heavy prices for war, not just in treasure but also in blood, mm-hmm. like when people lose their sons in a war like Vietnam, which makes no sense at all if you look at it. Even when you're sitting there in 1968, how could someone in Kansas really believe? that those barefoot peasants are any threat to them, you know, but they did. They somehow did. I mean, they, you know this, right? The whole, the whole culture of veterans in this country is 
intense and so powerful. And it's, it's actually, I call it the, the political correctness of the right. You know, it's the, it's the thing you can't say. You can't say anything about veterans. Mm -hmm. You can't even say things about the wars that they died in. It's really hard to do that in certain crowds. I, I now live half time in Oregon, or in, not in Portland, but like in Salem, which is the, sort of one of the hearts of this kind of thing. You know, it's like I, there's veterans all around me, and it's like I'm in a whole new world, and I know that I can't say anything. Veterans Day, Memorial Day, I got to hold my tongue. So I don't know, man. I, I, I'm not sure I even want the people to have the power to decide whether to go to war and, and their representatives, so long as their representatives are Democrats and Republicans. I mean, those people have terrible track records. I mean, that's, again, <laughs> where these ideas come from, especially the Democrats historically. So the, the thing I loved about your piece, the imperial presidency, and everyone should go read it right away. I mean, you, you sort of say, look, under Bush and Obama in particular, the presidency has gained all these new powers. List them. What were they? What, what does the presidency have that it didn't have before Bush and Obama? Well, Bush asserted some powers that were uh, knocked down by the courts. So, you know, if it would have been up to the Bush administration, the president could now detain anyone indefinitely without trial. And, and I would say surveillance is a, a topic that I've focused a lot on, especially since the Snowden leaks, but even before that in the whole post 9-11 era. The main thing is that we've created a system where you can almost rewind time, uh, which is to say we gather up a bunch of information. Say it's on who everyone calls, the phone calls that everyone makes, right? Uh, and not the content, just who you dial, who uh, the, the connections back and forth, or what numbers you text back and forth. And so we have this big social graph of who's talking to who. And the NSA doesn't have time to look at all of this on a daily basis. My dad is in there, your dad is in there, and it's basically in there in anonymity. And the defenders of the national security state will tell you, uh, look, it doesn't matter what we collect. It matters what we search. And you can see the logic in this, right? That to collect it all and have it sitting on a hard drive somewhere, it doesn't matter. It's when you actually search and say, oh, he called this person, this it's like, person. It's like the difference between knowing the address of your house and going into your house. Sure. And looking around. The government knows our address and always has. Right but it's not allowed to go inside our house without, sure. a, without a warrant. So, so yeah. what, what this is doing, though, is it's true in a sense that it, it's going and looking that matters. But in another sense, if you have all this information, you can go back at any time and you can see what, mm. who you were calling in 2002 and 2003. Hmm. So to give a, a, an example that's maybe more vivid that oh, I wow. think illustrates the point really well, they tested this surveillance system over Compton where they flew a fixed-wing aircraft over Compton for a day, like the entirety of the daylight hours, when was this? as I recall. Just a couple years ago. Oh, my God. Under and, Obama. And yes, it was under Obama, for mm -hmm. sure. And this is technology that was developed in Mosul, I believe, uh, certainly in Iraq somewhere, to um, figure out who are these insurgents who are planting roadside bombs. And so what they did was they put a fixed-wing plane up above Mosul, and it would fly all day, and it would just... They had cameras such that they could take in basically the whole city in high-res video. And, of course, there's not enough time to watch all of that video. But when a bomb goes off somewhere in the city and an American convoy is going by and a bomb goes off and it hits a Humvee and an American soldier is injured, you can go look at that explosion and then you can just zero in on that part of the city and you can rewind this video and you can go back and go back and go back and, oh, look, there's the guy planting the bomb. And then you can go forward and forward and, oh, look, there he's driving away from where he planted it. And then he's going and he stopped at the supermarket and then he went back to his house and there is his house right wow. there, right? So you can go back in time, essentially. Yeah. So they tested this over Compton. And the idea was if someone robs a bank or if someone carjacks someone, then you can't stop it as it's happening, but you can pinpoint it later. You can look at where that person came from and where they went to. So you essentially had total surveillance of an entire city. And, and I guess total is a little bit of an exaggeration in that if you go into a building, you can't see through the roof. But they'll, they'll fix that problem. But, but you know, <laughs> certainly surveillance. X-ray cameras, et cetera. Certainly right. surveillance of a degree that was more intrusive than anything described That's in 1984. Astonishing. Did you write about this? Yeah. Um, Are you the only person who's written about it? I've never heard about this. There are a few things that popped up. Why, have I, why do I not know about this? And this technology was tested in other American cities. There's a company that developed it in Iraq. It was a private contractor that is now trying to sell it to American law enforcement. And 
It only came up after the fact in Compton. If I'm remembering right, it was the LA County sheriffs that were testing it, and they chose Compton as one of the jurisdictions that they contract with. Not Beverly Hills. Not Beverly Hills. And it was later when someone on the city council, I believe, got wind of this that the press found out about it. I could be wrong about that. But but police departments have no legal obligation, or at least they would argue, and it, de facto it is how it is happening, to inform the public if they're going to test some insanely intrusive bit of technology like this, right? Mm-hmm. And so it has been tested in other cities. Uh, I think that there was a little bit of a, a tiny PR backlash, and then the guy went and tested it out of the country somewhere. Uh, but there are people actively trying to sell this kind of technology to police departments. All of so bracket that for a minute, and let's and, and let's go back to the presidency. The phone data that the NSA was collecting, uh, and some of the data that they're collecting now, it has this same kind of go back in time aspect to it. So that you're collecting a whole bunch of stuff, and then later, if you identify someone, you can go back and see who they called seven years ago. And if you think about, think about if China got a hold of this trove of information, right, mm-hmm. or Russia or any hostile power, North Korea. So suddenly, if they had it all, they could look, okay, here are all of the phone numbers of members of Congress and all of the people that they called. Here are all the American CEOs of companies that we compete with. What suppliers are the people in their company calling? Who are they doing business with? Who are their lawyers? What are their weak spots? Oh, you're running for Congress? What about your daughter's cell phone from five years ago? Mm -hmm. Was she calling any drug dealers to get marijuana delivered to Mm -hmm. her house? And wouldn't it be a shame if an opposition researcher knocked on your door and said, you might want to think about dropping out of this election because we have all of this stuff, not on you, but on your daughter or your brother or your mother. It's just a tremendous, and, and this is not even the content of calls. This is just, did you call a therapist, an abortion clinic? Right. It's just a tremendous amount of information if you can store it all and go back in time. It's like it's like the digital equivalent of the of the invention of the atom bomb. It's this new, incredibly destructive thing. Well, it could be great too, right? Because that's what happened with nuclear energy too. It could be, you know, very productive or very destructive. Yeah, absolutely. The question is, how will it be used and more importantly, who will use it? Mm-hmm. And, and there's kind of a debate among different civil libertarians uh, that especially If you talk to people in Germany, they will tell you that corporations are a much bigger threat to privacy than governments. Oh, well, and Um, and that's the that's the liberal or progressive line here, too. mm -hmm. Right there. They say this is almost uniform among them. Mm -hmm. They're much more worried about Google Mm -hmm. and corporations having this power than the government, which blows my mind. But anyway. And and then, you know, you'll hear other people say uh, it's the government, which if I have to pick one, I tend to think it's the government. But actually, it's it's not even so easy to draw these neat lines because we're in the Mm. era of information and security contractors. And so the distinction kind of breaks down if there's, you know. In some cases, yes. Right. If someone leaves the army and goes and starts a private company that then sells the technology back to the NSA and is this public? Is this private? Is it who can Well, but even even defense contractors, as corporatist as they are, Mm -hmm. cannot kill me without authorization by the government. They can't put me in prison right? They don't own a prison. They don't have the guns that they can use against me without authorization by the state, which has the monopoly on violence. So here's the question. Okay, so here, here's this new atom bomb, and Trump now has control of it. <laughs> God. I mean, Hillary Clinton having control of it, I think would be worse, actually, because she's smarter and has much bigger plans for us and the world than Donald Trump ever has, right? He's too dumb. He's not an intellectual, so in that way, he's less dangerous to me. He's more dangerous in that he's unpredictable, yeah. but I knew he would kill a lot of people. Like I said that all along. He will kill a lot of people. Most of them will be in the Middle East, but I think still, I still hold to this. I think he will kill fewer people than Hillary would have. Obviously, they're taking back Iraq or Western Iraq, at least. But I mean, that was, of course, Obama's project anyway, but um, no major new interventions, I guess I would say, under Trump. So I, I don't want him or her or anybody in the presidency to have that power. I don't think I want the people to have that power, the Democratic people, the demos, you know, the people acting through the state to have that power either. Well, so, I, I mean, I agree insofar so, as I don't want to have a ballot initiative. Do so, we go to war? Well, no. So like Compton, right? There's a great example. I'm sure that the cops are justifying this or they're saying they want this technology 
to surveil drug dealers and gangsters, I would imagine, in Compton, right? And well, guess who led the call for the war on drugs and the war on crime in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s? It was civil rights leaders. It was black ministers. It was black activists in Compton and all those neighborhoods. Mass incarceration, they pushed hard for it. They wanted mass incarceration of black people, black activists. Michael Javen Fortner's book on this It's very clear. And other people have done the research as well. I mean, you know, so if you actually left it up to Compton, the Compton City Council, for instance, and say even like the the black churches in Compton, you know, whoever the political leadership is in that town, in that city, whether they should have surveillance of drug dealers and gangsters in Compton. I, I wonder I'll bet how you there's would, a good chance they'd be all for this I wonder treating how it would Compton like Mosul. Yeah. I wonder. Uh, you're <laughs> certainly right that there was a time when this would have been true, that 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 there were prominent black activists, especially in churches and, and also parts of the civil rights establishment who were all about getting tough on tough on drugs, tough on crime. And I don't know. I don't know if it would, I don't know if they would still do that. I think that there's, a, I've seen a pretty big generational gap when I, well, yeah. and I've done, most of the interviews that I've done have been around Black Lives Matter as opposed to get tough on crime policies. But my sense of the generational gap is that the experience of the oh, yeah, last... But, but BLM doesn't have political power yet. They yeah. don't, I mean, DeRay lost the election. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't even close to winning the mayoral election sure. in Baltimore. Baltimore, Freddie Gray. Very few people know this. The reason the cops pulled him over on that corner that morning was that the church, there's a church right there where he was pulled over, that, what's her face, Mosley, the DA who became the hero briefly, mm-hmm. she, the church complained that drug dealers were working on the corner or on the street next to the church during Sunday services, Hmm. during services. And they complained to the DA, Mosley, what's her face, you know, who became the big hero, right? Who pressed the charges against the cops later. Mosley directed the Baltimore cops to increase surveillance of that street, of that block. And they were, those cops were the ones who nabbed Freddie Gray and put him in the van. Mm -hmm. That came directly from the black church right there, right? The black community leadership are directly responsible for what happened to Freddie Gray. Directly responsible. Have you, uh, have you read the book Ghetto Side or heard of it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so to me, this is a really, a really great book and a really important mm. piece of this puzzle, which is to say you have people like Heather McDonald at the Manhattan Institute who will argue, like Rudy Giuliani on, on the politician side, that the NYPD especially, and she would say other police departments to have saved more black lives than anyone by cracking down on crime in a way that led to this dramatic drop. And of course, there's a huge debate about what actually caused this drop in crime. Was it demographics? Was it policing? Was it decreasing levels of lead? And there are all these different hypotheses. But people like Heather McDonald would say it's the cops and, you know, black activists back in areas of high crime were absolutely right to want uh, more crackdowns in their neighborhoods. And even if this led to uh, high incarceration, that was the price you had to pay to get the murder rate down and protect law-abiding people, right? And then you have the kind of Black Lives Matter um, and ACLU and uh, more civil liberties kinds of people who would will certainly say policies like stop and frisk are violating the Fourth Amendment rights of people in cities, that there's tremendous innocent people caught up in this dragnet, that lots of people are being unjustly killed by the police. And Giuliani kind of steps into this argument and says, uh, you're both right in a way, which is to say, Heather McDonald, you're right that these communities suffer from a dearth of law and order. And Black Lives Matter, you're right that these drug cops are standing on corners harassing people and that it's not making these neighborhoods safer. It's in some sense it's making them more dangerous. And the distinction we want to make is between preemptive policing and enforcing criminal laws after the fact, especially murder. And Leovi would say, you're creating neighborhoods where if someone's killed in Beverly Hills, the LAPD is going to come in and they're going to dedicate a lot of resources to catching the murderer. And there's a very high likelihood relative to a murder that happens in another in South Central that they're going to get a clearance. And if you look at the clearance rates of homicide bureaus in rich parts of the city and in poor parts of the city, uh, part of this is an unwillingness of witnesses to testify uh, because they're afraid for their lives or because they have an ideology of no snitching. Both of those things happen. 
But part of it is just pure resources. And, you know, Leovi's reporting talks about something as simple as can the bureau in a high homicide area get the funding to get the windows tinted on the back of a car so that when they are bringing a witness in to talk to them about a homicide, the whole neighborhood doesn't have to see them in the back of a police car so they're safe. Do we have the money to put up a witness for three nights at a cheap motel uh, so that they're protected right before the trial? Just little pieces of funding like that. And that the answer is to take these tremendous resources that we've dedicated to shaking down people for small amounts of drugs on the street. And instead of having badly trained police officers who are just throwing people up against walls uh, because they're wearing the wrong clothing, instead, let's have a few more homicide detectives. Let's solve, let's, let's try at least to solve every murder. You're never going to get to 100%, but let's have it be our goal in the same way that, you know, People talk about the dichotomy between plane crashes and car crashes. If a car accident happens, people are like, well, car accidents happen. If a plane crash happens, they go and isolate the cause every time and say, what can we learn from this? Let's have more of the plane attitude when it comes to homicides. Every time there's a homicide, let's say, we should solve this. If we do not solve it, what was the problem? How do we do better next time? And like, how would it change these dangerous neighborhoods if the homicide clearance rate got up to the same level that it is in rich neighborhoods? Would you see murders go down precipitously? And she argues yes. And it seems to me this kind of middle point in the debate that maybe both sides could agree to and that would maybe improve things, uh, I hope. Who knows if it would work? Uh, I hate it. (laughs) Tell me why. (laughs) Because I will eliminate at least 50% of violent felonies right now. Ready? Mm -hmm. Legalize all drugs. So according to the FBI and the Department of Justice, 50% of violent offenses are committed by people in gangs. And I've seen estimates for the large cities that are more like 80 or 90%. Mm -hmm. Take South LA Mm -hmm. over the last 30 or 40 years. This is not news to anyone. The Bloods and the Crips would not have existed if crack were legal. They may have existed, but they would have been throwing rocks at people instead of having Uzis. They would have had no social power. They would have had no real power because they would have had no money. They had tremendous money and resources and power because drugs were illegal, not just illegal, but the United States, and in particular the Los Angeles Police Department, chose to enforce those laws as if it was World War III, you know, driving tanks into people's houses, et cetera, right? Right. Shaking down everybody. They took that law very seriously. Now, what were they doing? Glenn Lowry, you know, would say they were doing their job. And he's right. He's right. Heather McDonald would say that the cops were enforcing the law. What do you think cops do? Sure. Right? So to be mad at them for enforcing the law is stupid. They're right about that. The problem with the conservative position on that, which is Lowry's and McDonald's, is that they leave it there. And they don't look at the goddamn law in the first place that's creating these conditions, which is making these things illegal. Um, well, we're, we're in agreement so, that, that so, we should make them legal. So the ghetto side argument, you know, is that, as far as I understand it, and I think you missed a part of her argument, uh, but one is that we need better, more and better policing. Of a particular kind. Yeah. Yeah, M- yeah. More and better, I would say more and better homicide detectives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so enforce these laws better. Yeah, homicide in particular is what she's talking about. And yeah, after people have been victimized by yeah. crimes. So we're all for, you know, we're all for uh, stopping murder, sure. Um, but, and then I think the other part of her argument, as I recall, is that there is the cause of many of these crimes, or mm-hmm. most of them, I believe she says, is the culture in Compton and South LA. She says that most of these homicides are over trivial matters, over some guy getting pissed off that some other guy dissed him about his shoes or his girlfriend or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then no snitching. You did reference that, the no snitching part of that culture, which is true. It's there, yeah. Well, yeah, but she, but, just to be clear, okay. because I think people might miss this distinction. I mean, there's a lot of conservatives who make a kind of it's the culture of these places argument. And they'll talk about the lack of fathers and they'll talk about, um, you know, the need for religion and things like this. Um, Leovi's making a very distinct, it's the culture argument, right? Insofar as she argues that it's a cultural argument, she argues it's a culture created by people who cannot reliably go to the police when a loved one is murdered and expect them to solve it. 
and expect them to catch the person who did it. And so they take matters into their own hands. So that's her cultural argument. Insofar as, as it's cultural, that's her mm-hmm. argument, whether she's right or wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think it is cultural, <laughs> in part, in part. Mm-hmm. So I had a debate with Heather McDonald recently mm-hmm. on this very question. And for her, race is just irrelevant, and we need to look at other things. Well, so I think it's irrelevant in the—I think Black Lives Matter is wrong about how race— determines these things or racism determines these things. I I think there's very, very, very few instances of the last 10 or 20 years of cops shooting people because they were black, you know, because they were racist, the racist motivation. I just don't see any evidence for that or very, very little. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's, um, it's barking up the wrong tree. And then on the left, what you get is this idea, you know, this refusal to admit that crime rates among African Americans are much higher. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's amazing to me. I reviewed a book recently by a scholar, Harvard professor, in which she actually claims repeatedly not only that black crime rates were not higher than white crime rates over the last 50 years, they were actually lower, she suggests, in many places with no evidence. It's, it's quite amazing. Well, her, her argument is that increased policing spikes crime rates, right? That there's, the more cops you have in a neighborhood, the more crime they're going to see and report. Sure. But nonetheless i mean it's just well it's hard to there's no serious scholars who's i mean i know of who would say that black crime rates are equal to whites well yeah i think that there's compelling evidence that for example black people are prosecuted at a higher rate for smoking marijuana than white people but it's hard to it depends on the state but but if you look at murder the murder rate is higher oh there's no doubt like way higher it's like you can't um Crime rates, you can massage them in all sorts of ways, but the murder rate is a pretty good proxy for how many murders are it's, committed. It's this refusal to address. The, so, so the racists will say, we know what the racists say. Yes, right. cr- black crime rates are higher. Why? Because blacks are inferior and prone to violence biologically. Okay. Not my argument at all. Right. Um, but people are so afraid of being attached to that argument, mm-hmm. being associated with that argument, they can't even address the problem itself. They refuse to even acknowledge that there is this problem that, yeah, black people get murdered way more often than whites, and they get murdered much more often by black, other blacks. This is just true. Do we want this to continue? No. How do we get rid of it? We have to understand the cause of it. So here's my thing. Why is it that black crime rates are so much higher and have been in this country for not just the last 10 years, but probably the last 100 years at least, okay? So you you enslave a people, then you segregate them, you disenfranchise them, you all the while for 100 years tell them that they do not belong in this country, that they are inferior, they will never be citizens, they can't because they can't be citizens. And we're going to develop this whole culture, which is pretty repressed in many ways, quite puritanical, that looks down on the products of black culture that considers it jungle music and, you know, primitive gyrations, this is what they call black culture and dancing, et cetera, right? Well, and then we're going to prohibit by law things like alcohol and drugs and gambling and prostitution. And we're going to say, oh, only the racially inferior people do those things anyway. (laughs) Well, guess who's going to come along and enter those black markets that are created by those prohibitions? First, it was the immigrants, it was the Irish and the Jews and the Italians because they were racially inferior for a while and they didn't, they weren't assimilated and they didn't feel like this was their country. They were told it wasn't their country. So a lot of those gangsters who entered those markets for prostitution, gambling, drugs, and drinking were those. And then blacks all the whole time from the end of slavery to the present have as well, because again, they didn't feel like this was their country. They were told that until very, very recently. And they were told that, you know, only bad people do things like drink alcohol or take drugs or buy sex. Well, you know, they don't care because they don't belong to the moral structure of America. Then, of course, there's redlining and the segregation that that brought about. We're going to trap them in these neighborhoods with these black markets filled by the violent people, the bad, violent people, and leave them there. (laughs) And guess what kind of culture do you think will emerge from that? in places like Compton. It's just it's just a shooting gallery. It's a shooting gallery. We're going to make it very difficult for you to leave this place. Then we're going to prohibit this thing that's going to create this huge black market, which is going to simply encourage the worst people in your neighborhoods. It's going to give them power. It's going to encourage them to enter these markets, and we're going to give them tremendous power. We're going to make them rich and powerful so that they can buy Uzis and AK-47s, and that's that. So 
if you legalize the drug, <laughs> drugs, all of them really, the Bloods and the Crips have no basis for their power. They're nobody anymore. And the culture that they spawn, this is what I was getting at, the yeah. culture, I think these conservatives are right about that. Yeah, there's a culture where people shoot each other over their shoes. But I believe that that part of that culture, that violent, that hyper-violent part of that culture, comes from the fact that the Bloods and the Crips have determined or dictated much of that culture, that they became the heroes in those communities. People looked up to them and they were the ones who shot people over like insults. So it, I think it's, it's all connected yeah. ultimately to policy. Actually. Well, I, yeah, I mean, we're certainly in total agreement about the need to end prohibition in black markets and that that would go a ways toward solving the problem. Whether it would go the whole way, I'm not sure. Um, and, and I tend to think that Leovi is right that part of the cultural component here, at least, is you take any group of people of any race and you don't give them access to any kind of formal justice for people they know being killed. And the result will be a kind of vigilantism, a kind of tit for tat. I think that the rise of, I think that prohibition kind of created the gang culture that led to these problems. If it were if there were no more black market and drugs, would these gangs just go away now that they exist and they kind of have a foothold in various blocks where your father or your uncle or whatever is part of them? I don't know if it would they just would, go away. They would be broke. They'd have no money. So who would care? Uh, I mean, about a lot them. of them have no money right? already. Uh, the um, gangs do. The drug dealers do. The, they're the only rich people in the neighborhood. I, I don't know. And I, they have a whole lot of guns they buy with that money. So, so I wonder if you have, do you have any large, uh, other than thinking that Leovi is kind of missing this big prohibition part of the problem, do you have any objection to shifting resources from cops on the corner to homicide bureaus and trying to get the clearance rate way up? I object to not starting with legalizing drugs. So let's do that. And then if there are still problems, we can talk about fine tuning, whether we have tinted windows in cruiser cars and higher clearance rates. But let's, I, I, it just seems indisputable to me after, and it's not just, not just since the sixties, it's really a hundred years or more of pro various prohibitions, right? It's the big prohibition is the most famous example, right? What, what did prohibition of alcohol do to crime? And by the way, the culture of violence in this country, the murder rate spiked in the 1920s. And who became the biggest heroes in Hollywood films? Al Capone and John Dillinger, you know, the gangster genre became like the biggest genre in Hollywood in the 1920s and 1930s. It spawned this whole thing where it was cool to shoot people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I, I do object, not to you, but to yeah. her argument. And we have to start, let's start there. Let's start by legalizing those drugs. And then if violence doesn't decline, and I would bet my life that it will, but if it doesn't for by some weird reason, sure. Then we'll look at something else. It's the same argument I have about foreign policy in the Middle East. Terrorism, okay, is it caused by American foreign policy? Well, here's how, what I would like to start with. Let's try withdrawing the United States from the Middle East. And if those people over there still want to fly planes into our buildings, sure, then you have an argument, Rudy Giuliani. But right now, it seems to me that that's something we haven't tried that is a very likely cause of our problems. Yeah, I, I'm I'm persuaded enough that Leovi has a point, although I'm not certain that, that, that she does. But if you told me you can have this shift in policing toward homicide detectives that I want, or I can have prohibition ended, I certainly get rid of prohibition. I agree that I would do that first if it, if it were up to me. But it seems like it's an easier political sell to shift resources. Oh, sure. And so if I can do that in the meantime, I'm all for doing it in the meantime. Yeah. I mean, ending slavery was a tough political sell too. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, yeah, I understand why this is not a popular position, but it just seems to me crystal clear. I, I mean, I think people are starting to come around to it. You know, we know what happened in Portugal. We know that they legalized drugs more than 10 years ago and that all the bad stuff has declined since then, pretty much. Deaths, violence, addiction, all of that has declined. HIV rates, it's just, it's really frustrating. I worry that the opioid epidemic has set back people's willingness to try legalization. Even yeah. Despite happening while I prohibition think, was ongoing. I think you're right. Yeah, that is that is depressing to me. Um, oh, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, so long as we have a prohibition on these drugs, there's there's going to be very bad people with very big guns running around 
poor neighborhoods. I mean, that's just going to happen. I mean, historically, that's always what's happened. I don't see why all of a sudden all the Mexican cartels would stop sending their soldiers into the United States, which, by the way, this is one of the crazy things that Trump sort of said, which he was totally right about. And in fact, he kind of underestimated it. If you look at it, that is what's going on. I mean, the Mexican cartels have entered the United States in a big, big way, and they're actually pushing out the old black gangs in many cities, like in Chicago and in, and in the Midwest and in places like Kentucky. Go read like Kentucky news reports from Kentucky newspapers over the last two or three years and just type in like drugs and cartels. And you're going to see like murder after murder after murder by guys who just came from Mexico who are right. members of the Sinaloa cartel. It's amazing. Like they're taking over like the upper south and Midwest and the West Coast as well. There's a map. I just saw a map by the FBI charting all the Mexican gangs and their footholds in, in all these towns and cities in the United States. It's basically every city of any size in the United States. There's some Mexican or Central American gang has a presence there who have committed murders, who have committed murders. I mean, so as long as, as, long as the price is jacked up, for drugs by prohibition, and those are illegal, meaning it bars legitimate, respectable businessmen from entering that market, El Chapo and associates are going to continue to enter it, and they're going to keep ramping it up, and they're going to get bigger and bigger guns. I just, it just seems obvious to me. Yeah, Yeah. this is actually, there's a sense in which crime has been falling in the United States uh, in a pretty major way, and so it's allowed people to not look at it with the same urgency, whether it's ending prohibition, whether it's uh, a lot of other things. What amazes me is what prohibition has clearly done in countries like Mexico and Colombia, just the Mm. horrific carnage Mm. there, that people don't look at that and say, really, we're going to keep, we're going to persist in this policy that is literally ruining this country Uh, south of us? We, every day, if nothing else, we should just, every day, every American should just give thanks to every Mexican for not joining Al Qaeda and bombing the shit out of us. I mean, for what we've done to that country. I mean, it is, if, if we were, I mean, the terrorist threat should really be coming from that country. And it's amazing that it hasn't actually. They have every reason to hate our guts, what we've done to them. I mean, yeah, the bodies on the roads, the decapitated people, the missing, the, the, and just whole towns, whole cities taken over by these cartels, by these, the worst people in the world the violence, it's just, and it's all, of course, stemming from our drug policies. What policy would the heads of cartels hate the most? If they were worried about that, but what would they hate the most? They would hate legalization Legalization. the most. Of course they would. Yeah. It's their raison d'etre. It's their reason for being. It's just so frustrating and infuriating. And it's, I think it's just, it comes back to something that I've written a lot about. You know, it's Puritanism. It's the only way I can explain why Americans just hold on to this stupid idea that drugs should be illegal. I can't explain it any other way, that it's just this idea that, A, you know, it'll cause people to be... Well, I I actually posed this to Heather McDonald, and her immediate response was, well, I mean, people aren't going to work hard. (laughs) There's going to be a lot of people just like getting high and watching and playing video games, and no one's going to work. And I was like, yeah, that's that's Puritanism. There you go. And it it, it infects progressives, too. I mean, they they hold on to this, too. It's like, there's this fear that if we let, well, also there's no evidence actually that, that there's more drug use under a legalization regime. I think in Portugal, Greenwald and the Cato Institute have shown this, that drug use didn't go up at all. I think it's actually declined slightly in Portugal since drugs have been legalized, but, but I can't, there's no other way to explain it. Do you have an explanation for why Americans continue to hold on to this idiotic I don't think it's idea? Puritanism actually. Okay. I mean, well, there is this Puritan strain in, in the United States that courses through our laws. I don't disagree with that. Mm-hmm. And so in some sense, but I don't think Puritanism is the root cause, which is to say, go to Shanghai and look at their attitude toward drugs, right? Good point. Um, and, and so I think it must be a kind of deeper aspect of moral psychology that is, well, you know, maybe it's pe- the way that people relate to purity and disgust. Well, I say, or, a, you know, I don't, well, sorry, I mean, actually. I'm trying Shang- to think of my Jonathan I, Haidt. Well, right? in Shanghai, I was thinking, oh, but there's Confucianism, actually. I mean, so there's, uh-huh. a, there's a deep asceticism, which is in Puritanism and in other right. religions and other which, which to me, ideologies. Yeah, which, and that's what So there must them. be some common yeah. human impulse toward this kind of thing. And I, I, I just think the Enlightenment and liberalism have cracked certain codes and allowed us to make smarter decisions around some of the things that humans used to do very badly. And we haven't, <laughs> we haven't all come to the one outside of Portugal and a few other places that allow us to figure out this intoxicating substances the, thing. The great Enlightenment thinkers were all ascetics. John Locke wrote extensively about how dancing was bad. 
um, the founding fathers, you know, were railed against drinking um, and railed against gambling, railed against prostitution. Uh, they wanted people to be working hard all the time and serving their country too. The Enlightenment was devoted to science, right? Rational thought, which is in itself ascetic. You know, that's again another thing I don't like about my own profession. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, us intellectuals, we, we sort of, or, we're, we're organizers. We organize the world into ideas and put them on a paper and put it on a page with margins, you know, and there's rules to how you can speak about certain things. And it's all, it's all very rational and scientific, right? And we revere the scientific method, which is this organizing hard mean thing in which feelings and emotions and sensual pleasures can't be allowed because it'll screw up your formula, right? It'll screw up your essay writing. It'll screw up your policy writing. You know, when you're sitting down and writing a law, you have to shove away your, all your desires to go to the beach or see a movie or have sex with your girlfriend. You have to be, you know, you have to narrow your mind and narrow and, and eliminate your body in a sense and be completely of the mind in that moment. Mm-hmm. And that's all enlightenment stuff. I mean, that comes from the enlightenment. So I think they actually perfected asceticism. So can I ask you about you yeah. and your heuristics? <laughs> Please. Because <laughs> um, I know nothing. I know this. I just know your straight bio, you know, that you grew up in Orange County. I did, in Costa you, Mesa. Okay. And you went to Pomona, a very good college. Uh, certainly in the recent years, Pomona has been... Uh, rocketing up the rankings it has a gigantic endowment and it's considered to be like you know on par with Swarthmore and Har- Haverford and very elite colleges in the East Coast and sounds like you're a protege of Andrew Sullivan or at least you started your career under him is that right well actually I was after college I worked in newspapers for five years or so like local newspapers yeah out in the Inland Empire I was wow. at the Inland Valley Daily Bulletin huh. and then I traveled for about a year and came back to California and then was at the San Bernardino Sun briefly and went to grad school and then it was after that that in I journalism yeah in journalism yeah. Uh, yeah NYU gave me a scholarship was it a scholarship or a fellowship they paid for right. a master's degree mm-hmm. so I I was I never know what to tell people when they say, should I get a master's in journalism? Because if the answer is it's free, then sure. Oh, yeah. If it's $60,000 for a year, well, that might price you out of the industry. So I'd been reading Andrew Sullivan since about 2000, 2001, when he was blogging on his own site and then got into newspapers and was kind of reading his blog all the way along the way. He basically, am I right, had the first sort of commercial blog, commercially successful blog. In other words, a blog that became like a major source of income. Wasn't he the first person to do that? I don't know if he was the first. He was certainly one of the pioneers who did it. So I was a fan of his just as a reader. And then after grad school, I went and interned at The Atlantic where he had moved his blog right around the same time. And one of the jobs of interns was send Andrew a few things a day that he might want to write about. Mm -hmm. And I was very good at that because I'd been reading him for six years at that point or or something. And so I wound up leaving the Atlantic after that internship and and working at a startup web magazine for about a year with Peter Suderman and James Poulos. Oh, which one? It was called Culture 11, a short-lived project. Suderman, I know Suderman. Yeah, yeah we, we published a ton of people that you know, I'm sure. A reason guy, yeah. Um, but the venture capital pulled out right when the financial crisis hit because of other oh. investments. Was it a political magazine? Yes. What was its bent? It was right of center and not terrible. Uh-huh. Okay, so that folded, and then how'd you get... N- so then Andrew, Andrew hired me to help him with his blog, um, and I was working on that half-time and freelancing half-time. And, and so I, I'd been friendly with Andrew a long time and as an intern again had helped him uh, on the dish and then when, when I came back I was guest blogging while he was on vacation as well as feeding him uh, stuff to write about when mm-hmm. he was there and it's it was a great place to work first because when Andrew's on vacation and I would guest blog it was just a fantastic audience of really interesting ideologically diverse thoughtful people who you could ask any question in the world and they would write you pages and pages of fascinating emails to kind of engage with any question. And and I think the thing that I've stuck with most that I appreciated about Andrew's blog and and kind of learned watching him do is to just use engagement with readers to uh, further this kind of ongoing conversation. There's still a lot of times when I'll pose some question at the end of an article, and I've done this with college stuff, I've done this with 
Trump voters, uh, and just get really fascinating stuff back from people that is kind of richer and more textured than the descriptions of people's views that you see secondhand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <clears throat> Sullivan is, you know, he's described as an iconoclast. I never quite knew what to do with him. I, to be honest, I just, I was never, he never bothered me, but I just didn't find much of interest <laughs> there. And I think it was because I didn't get a, ha I couldn't get a handle on him, or maybe I felt like he didn't have his own handle. <laughs> and I also felt like, I guess the bigger problem for me was, unlike Christopher Hitchens, who was similarly iconoclastic and British, Sullivan has always seemed to me to have one foot in what I would call the establishment. There's, there is an establishment way of thinking. In other words, that you are concerned, you, you sort of take responsibility in a sense for you know, the great institutions of a country like the United States or the UK, right? And I always felt like that's never my thing. I'm always looking for the, for the people who are irresponsible in that way or just don't take responsibility. And they're just interested in critiquing from outside. Mm -hmm. And Hitchens, in my view, even though I hated him on the war and foreign policy, always felt at least like he didn't give a shit, basically. Or at least it wasn't his. The <laughs> White House didn't belong to him at all. Like, that wasn't his house. Whereas it felt to me like Sullivan sort of laid claim to the White House and 10 Downing Street. You know what I mean? Like, That's in other words, like, it's, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, um, it's a familial thing. Like, we may hate who the dad is. We may hate the members of the family, but it's our family. And so it's at the end of the day, we're going to, we have responsibility for it. We're going to protect it. And we want what's best for it. I've always gravitated toward thinkers, journalists, the very few academics, but there's some who are like this, you know, who, who are just completely outside. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Andrew is an interesting mix. He's someone who's lived yeah. in D.C. for a long time, but is certainly not of the D.C. culture, especially for someone of his prominence. He isn't the kind of person who gives a damn about going to the parties or being seen here and there. He's most happy kind of holed up in his uh, apartment with his dogs. Here's what did piss me off about Sullivan. Yeah. I just remembered. Of course, I can't believe I didn't remember this until now. I've actually written about him quite a bit. He made the most sustained, coherent, and powerful and effective argument for gay marriage from a conservative position. Now, yes. I shouldn't say I hate him for that. In some ways, I love him for that because my argument has always been that gay marriage is conservative. So he and I actually agree on the analysis. Uh -huh. It's just that for him, that's a great thing. you know. And for me, it's not such a great thing. For him, gay liberation of the 70s and 80s and all the sex and all the partying and all the freedom mm -hmm. that I would call freedom, you know, for me, that was great. That was one of the sort of one of the greatest moments actually in human history. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest moments of human liberation in, in history was the 1970s and 1980s among gay men in particular. Uh, and for him, it was basically disastrous. It was inviting catastrophe. It's what brought on the AIDS crisis. But I think more importantly for him, this is really his argument, is that it kept gays out of, not the establishment, he wouldn't say that, but it's kind of what he means, like out of citizenship, out of full citizenship, that it kept them marginal, that they would be perceived so long as they engaged in that culture in the bathhouses and the bars and the discos, they'd be perceived as outsiders and they, wouldn't, they would be denied their basic civil rights. I think you're right that he would say that. And, oh, yeah. No, I know that's well, his argument. And what he would yeah. certainly say in addition is that that culture, especially in places like uh, San Francisco and New York, where it was most centered and powerful, it was inherently political to a degree that isn't the end goal of humanity. In other words, it was necessary to have liberation struggle, and he, right. he was all for that. But the goal of that should be to get back to a post-politics place where you're just living life and everything isn't about activism and... Oh, no, I'm not talking about... When I, when I talk about the freedom of gay liberation, I'm not talking about the activists or the intellectuals or the political people. I'm talking about the guys who were fucking in the backs of trucks in Chelsea in the middle of the night mm -hmm. in the 1970s. There's a fantastic documentary called Gay Sex in the 70s. <laughs> and it's about that. It's about the flowering of the sexual freedom in New York City in the 1970s after Stonewall. And it's just actually really moving, even though it's about blowjobs, you know? I yeah. mean, it's really, really moving to me. Um, yeah, no, but I think you're right. Like for Sullivan, he doesn't see that as the end, a good end for anything. And I, to me, it's pretty damn good. I mean, it's better than what else we've had here. I mean, I think gays and, and those gays in particular have offered an alternative 
to the repression of our own society, of our own culture, of the dominant culture, mm -hmm. that has had tremendous effects on the dominant culture itself. It's sort of opened up space in dominant culture for much more freedom in those ways. But it also has always just been this alternative. You can like look over there and be like, oh, hmm, the gays have a point there. They seem to be having more fun than us married people going to Ikea to buy another crib. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which he literally, I think he may have literally said that at one point. Like it's what we need is the gays going to Ikea, something like that. It was like we need gays to be domesticated, to be living in a house as husband and wife or husband and husband or wife and wife with kids in a suburb, you know, and to be good American citizens culturally and politically. A very famous essay that he wrote, I think, in The Atlantic, wasn't it? In fact, I think he call, it's called the, cons is it called The Conservative Case for Gay Marriage? He definitely wrote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah Conservative okay, Case yeah, for yeah. Gay Marriage. I don't, I don't think, though, that he would define the living in the suburbs and going to Ikea as the model of good citizenship. Hmm. Um, to me, it was more, I do think that he would say that the the high point of the gay liberation culture that you're talking about was as much a reaction to repression as what uh, the majority of gay people actually wanted. I think you would argue that something like the relationship that, say, Dan Savage talks about um, is, in fact, what most gay people actually wanted was the kind of optimal end goal. You, Dan does, Savage was married. I mean, Dan Savage is... Right. The way he talks about his own marriage. Right. Okay. Not exactly... Um, not exactly the same as mm -hmm. as the traditional heterosexual yeah, so by the um, way, model of marriage, but also basically monogamous and also uh, yep. monogamish, as he would put it, mm -hmm. with deep commitment to one person that is recognized by mm -hmm. the community. Yeah. Say. So here's an empirical question. How true is that? He said most gays want that. I have no idea. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't either. And it's interesting that the evidence doesn't just seem to be available, just the data itself. Like, what's the marriage rate among gays? What's the divorce rate among gays? I've heard rumors that the divorce rate's really high, but I haven't seen that substantiated. But I don't see clear evidence that it's a majority of certainly gay men uh, wanting that. I just don't. I think, in fact, what we're seeing is a very, it's just not talked about, sort of a, a quiet, tacit resistance to marriage, meaning that I think a lot of young gay men just aren't getting married. They're not doing well, what they're supposed to. A lot of straight people aren't getting married. That's at true. This point That's right. Well, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. But I do think that, which is really ironic, right? So the entire culture is moving away from marriage at the right. very moment when Andrew Sullivan <laughs> and the gay marriage movement are saying, this is what we should do. We should be swimming fast for that sinking ship. <laughs> but certainly most people agreed with him in this debate within the gay community about whether gays should be fighting for equal marriage rights or whether this was, in fact, a part of the establishment that gays ought to gleefully reject. Andrew's side won, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and so... Oh, they definitely won. Now what's the revealed preference? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. No, It'll be interesting won. to look at. So you're working for him. And that blog, by the way, was... I used to look at it and just... Partly why I wasn't interested <laughs> was just that it was, just seemed like so much work to put that thing out. It just had so much in oh, it. Yeah. It was just immense the amount of work. I, I understood that he had people like you working yeah. for him. But my God, if someone, if you go back and look at it, you know, back in the day, it was like just the yeah. number of items that were mentioned and the, oh boy. Well, it's funny. I, it was, it was overwhelming. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. as a consumer, it was too much. I have mixed feelings about it in this sense. My favorite pieces by Andrew are his longer, more considered essays. I think he's very good, uh, obviously, as a, as a blogger. Lots of people oh, read yeah. him. Lots of people loved it. Yeah. Uh, I love it when I get to read him about something he's really thought about and kind of grappled with more. I think that's true of most people. Sure. Um, what I miss about his blog, especially now, um, is his kind of inclusiveness rounding up different arguments and his willingness to publish something and then have someone email him and rip what he wrote to shreds and then publish it and say, well, this person's got me here. Hmm. And uh, I didn't know he did that. That ethos of kind of publish the strongest dissents and also air different arguments. It's hard to find anyone. That's great. And I think that this is actually something that has changed from the era of the blogosphere to the era of social media. There was this built in incentive when people were writing blogs the kind of way that your blog got discovered was you would engage with someone and then you'd email them and you'd say, hey, 
I agreed with this thing you wrote or I disagreed with this thing you wrote. And then you'd hope that they would link back and write about it and that you would go back and forth and that you would kind of both share each other's audiences in some sense. And there was a lot of cross-pollination and discussion among people of different viewpoints. Now when traffic on the internet is driven by what people share on Facebook most of all and on Twitter to a much lesser but still a little bit relevant extent, um, people share now, most people share, whatever it is that helps them send signals to their in-group that they're part of this Mm in-group. And it leads to a lot less talking Mm -hmm. between different groups and a lot more um, intra-group kind of extremism. There is this, um, who was it that was, someone was telling me about an experiment that they did. It might've been Cass Sunstein. I hope I'm not wrong about Hmm. that. But basically the experiment was to go to Boulder, Colorado and to go to Colorado Springs, Colorado. One uh, very conservative community, one very liberal community. And to introduce a few topics, one of them was gay marriage. One of them, I forget the others, but they were common political arguments like that. And the experiment was you get a group of 20 people in a room in this community and you have them pick what they think about gay marriage before they go into the meeting and then talk about it with everyone. And then at the end, summarize what was the group opinion and what is your opinion now. And the effect in both Colorado Springs and in Boulder was to push people farther to the right and the left extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the experiment basically showed if you put people in groups like this, people will reliably come out because, of, uh, because people are social and because of the way that people reinforce one another's beliefs, you will reliably come out with more extreme beliefs in both cases. And I see some of this in the way that social media works and the kind of interactions that it incentivizes. Mm-hmm. Um, you sound very much like Connor Friedersdorf right now. Uh, I don't know if you've read him, <laughs> but... Um, but you are also describing something you write about a lot, which is campus politics. Yeah. I mean, that's very Absolutely. much takes place there, right? That's the same phenomenon that you've written a lot about. Um, and that's how I discovered you, I think, was um, uh, I was teaching at Occidental College mm-hmm. about, I started there in two, 2010, and the sexual assault sort of, whatever you want to call it, thing happened in 2012, mm-hmm. 2011, right around there. And Occidental was kind of the epicenter of that stuff, because a lot of people who became sort of national leaders in the movement to stop sexual assault on campuses were there for whatever reason, just by accident. Anyway, and I, and, and I just saw the whole faculty either join in on this stuff and like, you know, a kid actually ended up getting expelled and it's clear that he was railroaded. And, but anyway, I saw faculty either joining in on this stuff or being just silent like sheep in these faculty meetings mm-hmm. where these presentations were given by these faculty about the one in four or one in five statistic, women colleges are raped. And then there was, at that time, there was the sort of super predator (laughs) version of their argument, uh, which was that most rapes and sexual assaults are committed by a small number of men, but that on any given college campus, like Occidental, there were some crazy number, like I forget what it was, but like 10 or 20 or 30 of these men or something like that. And they were among us and they were just rapists, you know, they were almost innately. And also the argument was made, by the way, by very sophisticated people otherwise in social sciences, seriously, that there was nothing you could do about these men, that they were just innately sexual aggressors. And so they had just had to be done away with, mm-hmm. in this case, of course, expelling them. Right. I don't know if you started writing about that then. You must have. But then, and then about a year or two later, that had its own sort of backlash and kind of that's been kind of fading from the scene on college campuses. And then it was replaced in like 2014, 15 with this new uproar emergence of this stuff about race. And Occidental was another, was an epicenter there too. And you really weighed in heavy on that. And I I followed you a lot on that. And I liked a lot of what you argued. Tell me if this is is correct or a fair summation of your argument. Or your, your primary concern, it seemed to me, was that these claims were exaggerated first of all, of threats to the safety of black students on campuses. Those were exaggerated. And that that exaggeration then justified essentially attacks on speech. 
and academic freedom on campuses. And that free speech, when it is threatened on, a, on college campuses, not just one or two, but all of them, or most of them, mm -hmm. really will end up having negative effects on the society as a whole because the people who graduate from places like Occidental will end up running the damn place. And they're going to have these ideas about speech, which are not so great, that are hostile to free speech. Yeah, so well, is so that let a me, decent summation of what you were arguing? I would put it this way. Certainly okay. the part about my concerns about free speech uh, and at, at public schools, freedom of association, I'm very concerned of, about the kinds of arguments that are being made and the kinds of restrictions that are being put on free speech. When it comes to the claims of black students, say, I hesitate to use the word exaggerated only because I'm myself confused about, well, I would put it this way. I think that there are campuses in America where black students face terrible hostility from a uh, small number of peers. Really? Right. Um, really? Yeah. I, where? I have not seen that evidence. What do you mean? Like actual racist hostility? Yeah. From whites? Um, sure. I, you know, uh, so... I honestly have not seen evidence of that. I, I mean, I'm not talking about burning crosses on the quad. Mm -hmm. uh, I am talking about shitty comments, um, kind of uh, racist stereotypes being used in okay. pernicious ways. Okay, sure. um, And there are campuses, uh, and Yale is one of them, where I do think that black students are stopped by campus security more often in a way that their peers aren't. And it's a complicated issue because if campus security gets a call that there was some crime in the neighborhood committed by a black person, and then they start stopping black students who fit that description, this is the thing that is both disproportionately affecting black students and is an imposition on them, uh, and is also not rooted in some animus that the campus security has against. So it, it's uh, it gets complicated very quickly. Oh yeah, I will say that you know I've, I've heard grievances from black students at some campuses that I think are absolutely accurate and terrible and something should be done about them. I've heard grievances from black students at some campuses that I think are absurd and uh, that uh, are, uh, nothing should be done about them because they're absurd, right? But what I would say is in all of these cases, speaking about them as the safety of black students is threatened is a category error. Mm -hmm. And it's a category error that doesn't help the black students. Right. It, it, it's the thing I always think about when fake hate crimes come up, right? There was one at the Claremont Colleges, I think right after I graduated, I was still a reporter in the area, huh. and there was a white professor who wrote um, anti-black and anti-Jewish slurs on her own car and made it appear as if she was targeted because she was an ally to these students and that this was evidence of animus on this campus, right? A, a professor did this? A professor did this. Which college? Uh, I, I think it was Claremont McKenna. But it was one of the Claremonts. Yeah, it was one of the Claremonts. When you were there. Yeah. Oh, my God. And she went to jail, uh, she went to jail. for insurance fraud because she reported her car. <laughs> uh, I, I believe her name was Carrie Dunn. Although what did she teach? Do you remember? This. I don't remember. Her field? I'm curious about that. But wow. what I always think about about these cases wow. that pop up from time to that. time, right? If you think about someone who is, in her mind, she's trying to create awareness of this problem that she really believes exists, mm -hmm. right? But... In doing so, she's convinced a bunch of 18-year-olds who are away from home for the first time that there's some lunatic spray-painting cars, and what are they going to vandalize next? Maybe they're going to get violent, right? You sure. could see how you'd be reasonably scared if yep. you were an 18-year-old and this happened Absolutely. in the parking lot behind your dorm. Yep. And these fake hate crimes always have the effect of making some target population, whatever they may be, sometimes it's race, sometimes it's gender, sometimes it's religion or ethnicity, it makes a group of people feel scared just as an actual hate crime would. Mm -hmm. It spreads fear in that way. I wouldn't say the rhetoric of safe spaces and unsafety uh, is as pernicious as faking a hate crime. The one parallel I will draw is that in the same sense, if you keep telling people you're unsafe, you're unsafe, even if you're kind of actually speaking metaphorically or whatever, this message gets through. These, these are kids who are uh, away from home for the first time. They're in an unfamiliar place. And if you have these authority figures saying, you're not safe here, your, um, your body is under threat every day, yeah. it's like, no. If, if what you mean is that people are occasionally engaging in pernicious stereotypes verbally, say that. That's enough in itself to object to. It's fine to object to that, right? Don't tell people that they're unsafe because you're doing two things. One, 
you're you're creating a sense of lack of physical safety, and and that's not helping them. And you're also making people and their sense of themselves and their own safety on a college campus and whether they're welcome there, you're tying that to the worst thing that the worst person does, mm-hmm. right? And surely that is neither the most healthy for these students nor the most intellectually defensible. And so if you're at Yale and there is one student that wears the most pernicious blackface costume you can think of to a fraternity party, and most people at Yale are horrified by this, what is the proper reaction to this? Is it to cancel classes for a day and to uh, treat it as a physical threat to every person of color on campus? Or is it to acknowledge that this is a bad thing for the reasons that it is bad and to send the accurate signal, I would argue, that there are, in every population in the world, there's going to be a few assholes. Sometimes there are going to be a few racists, right? And to send a signal that these people have no physical power in this place. They have no moral power. Everyone is against them, basically. And that they do not define whether this space is welcome, whether you have as much right to be here. Uh, it, it is wrong to conceive of it. It is wrong to give them that power. And it's obviously uh, difficult in many ways. There's a lot of nuances to this if you look at a different case. But um, my, the kind of two pegs of what I think about on campus are, one, just about every civil libertarian thing that's out there ultimately serves the least advantaged people the best. Free speech is not protecting the most powerful people. By definition, they're not going to be punished for their speech. Uh, It was something that came up in that debate with Jelani Cobb at Connecticut College, where at one point he said, well, you can talk about freedom of speech in the First Amendment, but and it's good in many ways, and I too support it, but you have to remember that Woodrow Wilson aired Birth of a Nation at the White House, and to, to which I responded, I actually didn't know that, and that's awful, but if you're telling me the president of the United States was airing this Klan movie at the White House, it wasn't the First Amendment that was protecting his ability to do so. Hmm. It was the fact that the powerful people in the country at the time thought that this was perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. The First Amendment is only protecting the things that the powerful people don't want out there. Right. That's the category of speech. And it blows my mind that people on these college campuses that can look to the very recent past when hate speech laws were used to protect black students wildly disproportionately, even though they were put in place to protect them at places like uh, Michigan back in the 1990s. Even though the most recent example is that these things hurt marginalized students the most, and even if you look at the kind of larger culture of call-outs, right, it isn't racists that are being hurt by this. It isn't, it, it's mostly people who are like, radical feminists who are having fights with radical queer theorists who have a different view of the inherent nature of gender. It's people within these far left communities that have to deal with both whatever the disagreement is and also losing their friends through stigma and Mm -hmm. censure. And the people who kind of don't buy into any of it, who don't buy into microaggressions, those people are over here having a fine time on campus because their friends aren't stigmatizing them and calling them out for every little thing. Mm-hmm. So I just, I just think that there are all the civil liberties objections, which I totally believe and uh, argue for all the time. But then to go a step farther, uh, the people who have erected the current kind of prevailing culture on campus, I do not think that they are serving the students that they purport to want to serve well. I think that they have a decent point when they say, look, Colleges have gotten more diverse in all of these ways in the recent past, and there are various student populations uh, that feel uncomfortable here in various ways, and we should do something about that. I think there are ways that that's true. I do not think that the actual (laughs) methods that they are using are serving those students uh, very well at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very powerful argument that I've heard you make and someone else, I forget who it was, another, um, it was an academic, I forget who it was, but uh, made the argument that free speech has always served minorities in particular dissidents, political minorities. Right. And I think that's very powerful. So let's think now, why then would professors in particular on campuses not be in favor of free speech on their, on their own campuses? Well, because guess what? They are the powerful there in that context. 
who's even more powerful than the average professor, the professor of color, the student of color. Those people are very powerful in a particular way. I mean, they're powerful and they're not powerful simultaneously. They're untouchable. You can't say anything about them. You can't criticize them even in public without being thrown under, under the bus. They're also, students of color in particular, but I think faculty as well, are also powerless in an odd way that's never talked about. So, so first of all, let me stipulate. You and I have never been black college students, so we don't know what it's like. We can never know, and all of our claims begin there. So we can make some empirical observations, right? So the, the I know, because I've done the research, that there has not been a, a racist act of violent crime on a college campus in more than 25 years. There's been no, nothing, nothing that's been demonstrated by the courts or anything as an act of violence motivated by racism on a college campus against blacks in more than 25 years. Really? Wow. Yeah. Can you think of one? I can't, yeah. uh, but well, I haven't isn't thought that, about it. Well, isn't that curious? Well, but you, but you have thought about it. You've been writing about it and thinking about it professionally for years, and you don't know. It sort of proves my point here. It doesn't happen, of course. So college students on a, in the United States of America are the safest physically, physically, the safest people in the history of the world. I certainly agree that they're very physically safe. Physically, the safest people in the history of the world. That goes for black students, Latino students, white students, Asian students, all of them are physically extremely safe. In fact, when they die, it's almost always because of their own actions, falling off of a roof when they're drunk or dri you know, driving into a pole or whatever. Right. There is no physical threat, or there's just almost no physical threat to anybody on those college campuses. So we know that. All right. So all these claims about our bodies being endangered, our bodies under threat, and are just wrong empirically. Empirically, it's safer to be on any college campus than to be anywhere else in the United States for a person of color. You are safer on a college campus than anywhere else in this country. So it is just empirically false to say that they are endangered by entering <laughs> Pomona College or Oxdale right. College. The, right. the only caveat I would offer, mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm substantially in agreement, I'm sympathetic to students who say, I'm being targeted by local police or by campus police in cases where campus police carry guns in ways, you know, I've seen taser videos on the internet. I've seen this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, but setting aside whatever threat exists from law enforcement, right. as far as other, uh, as far as faculty and other college oh, students, yeah. I'm in agreement. Yeah, 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 exactly. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, the numbers are just, absolutely. I mean, when you're much safer on a college campus than living in most places yeah. that a 20 something year old would live. Yeah. When, otherwise. Yeah, when cops are around, that's a different story. That's yeah. a different institution we're talking about. That's a whole different discussion. But no, I mean, feeling threatened by college administrators and professors and students physically is ridiculous on the face of it. I mean, there's just no evidence that they should feel, you know, they should feel very safe, in fact. Anyway, so that seems really clear to me. So mm -hmm. the thing is that almost all the claims, as you know, that have been made by activists on campuses is about this physical safety. You know, that we are physically unsafe here. And so their demands often are about that, right? And they conflate certain intellectual challenges and certain slights, like what microaggressions are called, with physical violence. And the language they have to talk about anything regarding race and racism is taken from history that they're taught in classes. The only ways in which they can think about race and racism comes from the history of the civil rights movement and the history of slavery or particular histories of the civil rights movement, history of slavery and Jim Crow. It all becomes conflated. This is what I see. Mm -hmm. So if a professor says something, whatever, who knows, something politically incorrect in their classroom, whatever it is, doesn't matter, you know, um, says something that might be stereotyping of African-Americans, okay? That, in my take of this, becomes conflated immediately with everything that's ever happened in the United States that has been murderous toward African Americans. So that is Jim Crow, that is slavery, that is Bull Connor, that is the dogs and the fire hoses in Birmingham, right? And you've seen this, right? This, the language that erupts immediately is of those times and places and applied to this thing that is not of that. It's not physical. It may not even be racist. Okay, so a person who is unfamiliar with college campuses and what life is like for anyone on a college campus would look at this, and people do see this, as like just hysteria. It just looks to most people, I think, 
as hysteria. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't match what's actually happening here. Now, as I said, these claims about physical safety are ridiculous mm -hmm. and just false. <laughs> However, I think what's missed in this is the whole structure, the racial structure of college campuses and universities that's been built up over the last 50 or 60 years, which I call racial liberalism, which is <laughs> this idea that we're going to pull these people into our institutions. It goes back to our discussion about gay marriage. Pull these outsiders into our institutions and then train them to be like us. It's assimilationist. So we're also going to try to get the best of them so that they can serve as models to others. We're going to try to get as many Barack Obamas into Occidental College as possible because he's going to be a model to other blacks. And maybe more importantly, he's going to demonstrate to hostile whites, to racist whites, that black people can be just like us. It's an assimilationist paternalism. Black people, black students in this case, 18 year olds are pulled out of neighborhoods like Compton. This is pulling together all our discussions, right? And brought to this place where they are one in 20 kids in a classroom. All the other kids are white kids from the suburbs. And they have the pressure to be a model black person. They are expected to, and this has been stated by diversity officers. It's, it's actually the, it's the explicit argument for diversity, right? They are supposed to represent the black experience. Right. This was, well, this was, this is explicit. Okay? This was explicit in like the Michigan affirmative action case. Um, that is, no, that's still the yeah. argument, right? If we don't have these kids on our campuses, no one will represent that point of view. Although it's, it's very much, uh, there is controversy about this now. Well, okay. It, but that's, which, which is to say there are, there's a split now among administrators who will still tell you this, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, and among students who believe this and other student activists who will say, you've explicitly stated that our job here is to speak up for this community that is putting pressure on us. Sure. That is undo. Oh, yes. Stop doing that. Some students, a few, not, not but, enough. But this is like leftist progressives doing no, this. No, I know. I know. Yeah. I, I, too few have said that, but some have, yes. But just imagine this, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> this may, again, I've never been a black college student, but I know, I do know that these are the structures, okay? Yeah, well, and let me and actually- so, so there you are. So, so there you are. You're in this place. Oh, and on top of everything else, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and again, we're not allowed to say this, but this has to be talked about. Affirmative action, just plain and simply, lowers the standards for African-American students and other students of color. So they come in, generally speaking, less prepared to do college work. I mean, that just is a fact. And that's why there are all these remedial programs in all these colleges for those students. I mean, how else? That is just what it is. I mean, I don't know how else to talk about it. And we're not allowed to say this, but it's true. So imagine all those different things going on for you, right? You're in this classroom, you're the bl one black kid, all the other, all the other kids are from the Valley or, you know, San Francisco, and you're from Compton, and you, your math scores simply weren't as high. So being in this, this math class in college is just going to be harder for you than it is for them. And you're supposed to represent the black experience and everyone in that classroom, including the faculty member, knows that's why you're there. And so it's just well, so a, a can, couple so, 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 yeah. so hysteria, right? Crazy, so-called craziness. I begin to understand why black students on college campuses might be a little bit crazy. So it make a, me crazy. So I have a couple of disagreements okay. here. One is that I am not convinced that the phenomenon that we're talking about is actually disproportionately favored by black students. You see... Which outcome? I, I, this culture of, like, the whole basket of things that you're talking about. That they, that they want this. This culture of protests, the kinds of things you're seeing on college campuses across the country, the, the mm. prevailing culture there, right? Mm -hmm. When I go around to college campuses and talk to people, whether at Yale, UCLA, I encounter plenty of black students who thought that, for example, uh, the whole Halloween email controversy with the Christakis's was overblown and disagreed with the other black students, right? I find this everywhere I go. It seems to me that ideological progressives do a lot of talking about what students of color want. Oh, yeah. And in fact, it is not 
what students of color want. It is what ideological hmm. progressives want. Hmm. Some of them are students of color. This, who I, think we, I think we do agree, actually. Who legitimately yeah. want it. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the structure I just described yeah. was created root and branch by progressives. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's... I mean, it's generally white people on college oh, campuses yeah. that are um, pushing all these ideas. The other piece I want to talk about, I don't think that the affirmative action piece that you were talking about is actually very important at the elite institutions that are covered in the media. I haven't dug that deep into this, but like the most persuasive stuff I've read about an effect of affirmative action, uh, I don't know if you read the UCLA paper about mismatch theory. Yeah. San, uh, what's uh, name? And um, it was focused San, on law Sander? schools. Richard Sander? Yeah. Yeah, he's written about mismatch. Yeah. And his work suggests that it's one tier down where you would actually find the greatest mismatch because you have elite institutions that are competing sure. for the very best people. Harvard can, small enough. Harvard can get the very, very best right. black kids. Yeah, who can compete, who can compete. So yeah. if there's a shortage, if there's a shortage in the United States of black students who go to the very best secondary schools because they're stuck in neighborhoods where there are terrible schools. And there's nevertheless a demand of every college to have X amount of black students. You would think, theoretically, that it would be the second tier of colleges that would have the most trouble attracting enough black students to meet their diversity needs who come from places that are academically prepared by their high schools to to do the work, right? And yet, when I go to second tier institutions and talk to people and observe the culture and read college newspapers, it's a lot less crazy it's not there. than yeah. at elite institutions. It's not happening there. Yeah. It, like the culture is just totally different. And a lot of what people think of as the craziness going on on college campuses right now just doesn't well, exist at second and third tier institutions. Now, there are exceptions. Well, no, you uh, can find like Evergreen State, w which is like madness going on. Yeah. And it's not a first tier institution. But like, well, wait a second. For so, some reason, second and tier, third tier institutions just don't have the same. Well, you know what? Yeah. Stuff going on as the Harvards and Browns and but I think, Yales of the world. But I think mismatch is still a part of it. I mean, I think that there is mismatch going on at the elite schools too. Maybe not at Harvard. Maybe not at the very, very top. But I know at Occidental. I know for a fact that admissions have different standards for students of color. I don't know about Occidental. Oh, yeah. I um, mean, every school I've been at, because I've, I've known administrators very closely, and including at admissions, and they've all said to me, oh, yeah, sure, we have, we have to have different standards. Otherwise, we will not have diversity. We will simply not have diversity. You know, the, in fact, when I was at Occidental, I had a, a member of the admissions department tell me personally that the, there was not a single student in, the, in all of East L.A., not a single student in all the high schools in East L.A. in the area where Occidental is, mm -hmm. uh, who qualified for admission to Occidental College. The valedictorian at the local high school in Eagle Rock, where mm -hmm. Oxy is, did not meet the, the qualifications for Occidental admission. So I know it's a minority, but it's still, a, it's, a, it's a large minority, I would say, of black students on campuses doing this stuff. And the way they talk about it is it, as if it's an existential threat, right, to them. They are facing an existential threat every day. That's the way they talk. Well, so again, on the face of it, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. But actually, if you understand, I think, the structure that they've been brought into, I could see it feeling, feeling like an existential threat to your psyche, to your identity. Because again, I just imagine you're sort of like this, you're treated like a cutout. And then there's also this sort of whole patronizing culture. Black people and Latinos too are just patronized constantly, meaning that they're never challenged about their ideas. They're never criticized about their ideas. They're never... They're, everybody's afraid of them, right? So everybody's sort of walking very gingerly around them. Everyone's terrified of being called a racist or being suspected of being a racist or not being sufficiently woke. I mean, I know this. This is my world. I've been in it for 25 years. Yeah, it would make me crazy. I don't know. <laughs> but it's and I would have extreme reactions to it. I could see that. You know? Yeah, I mean, I do agree with you about this one thing, which is that there are all of these forces that are, and, and I don't think it's actually just black and Latino students uh, but I think it's, a, to some degree, all students, uh, and certainly women, gay students, straight white men have kind of a different relationship that maybe we can talk about in a second. Uh, for everyone else on college campuses, there are cultural forces that are um, trying to fit them in. I'm, I'm trying to think of, was it Jonathan Haidt that was first writing about victimhood culture mm -hmm. uh, as compared to dignity culture yep. um, that are 
creating, that are basically telling them over and over again, you're under attack, right? And this isn't, it's kind of hard to pinpoint this, right? Because it's not that the president of college is writing this. It's not that the, um, it's, that it's officially part of the curriculum. Rather, it's a pretty large group of student activists. And I don't know how large the allied kind of faculty wing is. I'm, I always find many more people disagree with this than agree with 10%. it everywhere I go. It's 10%. But they're, it's not bigger than 10%. It's weirdly like this yeah, it's very a, vocal minority. It's always a minority, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that class is really missing from all of this. Hmm. That mm-hmm. um, if you want to talk, like, you know, I was saying before that I think that there are real obstacles that uh, black students, for example, face on campus and that uh, Latino students I'm a little bit less familiar with just because of the particular controversies that I've reported on. But people who don't come from the upper middle class, I think, by the same token, face real obstacles. Absolutely. Uh, and obviously, some of those people are the, you know, overlap with the poor from black and Latino kids from poor families, but also white kids from poor families. It's a big cultural gulf. Well, and it, I, it, it definitely affects all these things we're talking about. No one talks about how. No, like, I can't find anyone who's, I found like one writing professor who studies this. It's a big missing thing. Yeah, well, I know this. I mean, uh, white working class and white poor students don't exist on those campuses. They mm-hmm. don't exist. I've never had, as far as I know, a student, and I've been at Columbia, Barnard, New School, Occidental, and now Willamette University, all mm-hmm. basically elite, top tier top 100 schools. I, as far as I know, I've never had a single uh, poor or working class white student, mm-hmm. not one. Isn't that amazing? Um, and you wonder why that demographic voted for Trump. <laughs> I really do think, I mean, I've gone on about this in other episodes and I've written about this too. You know, I think that the election was very much a civil war between those who are of that culture of college, of the elite colleges in particular, mm-hmm. and those who are not. Yeah. Well, I really, race-based affirmative action goes in a box of a bunch of different policies that strike me as um, whatever else one thinks about them. They're zero-sum policies. I never object when people say students of color on X campus uh, are treated badly in some way. That makes me think, okay, let's talk about that way. Let's investigate it. Let's see if this holds up. And like I said, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, When it comes to solutions, I always want to say, if you can find a solution that is not zero sum, you're going to be able to sell it a whole lot better to a whole larger swath of people. And you're going to be able to help people in a way that is more sustainable and politically safe. And isn't that like... Isn't that what we're after? If we agree that there's a problem and that we should help people, don't we want to do it in the way that is not going to be overturned, that is not going to uh, create resentment and more conflict that's going to hurt this group of people that we want to help? Hmm. The pushback I often get is, well, the African-American experience in the United States is different from any other experience. You have to acknowledge that. I think that's correct. Sure. I don't think that it— Whatever the African-American experience is. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it refutes the point, which is mm-hmm. um, we're still living in a world where we have to live together. and have. So if, if what you're saying is you want me to acknowledge that as, as a sign of good faith or respect, well, I think it's actually correct that slavery is unlike anything other than perhaps the Native American mm-hmm. uh, yeah. experience with early settlers, right? Uh, that's the only thing I could think of comparing it to. Uh, yeah. But the argument boils down to this. Malia Obama deserves affirmative action and white people who live in trailers do not. Right. Because the black experience is that much different and that much worse and harder than any other experience. And by the way, a whole lot of affirmative action goes to basically wealthy black kids. What and if you wealthy put it, black kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's amazing is that if you if you put that to Barack Obama, he would say, oh, you're absolutely right. Malia shouldn't get a boost when she's applying to colleges, mm-hmm. right? And yet on a college campus, try and find a faculty member who will say that out loud. Oh, it would be much more difficult, even though it's a perfectly mainstream position mm-hmm. um, that lots of people, even on the left side of the cultural divide, would agree with. Do you know, um, do you know Barbara Fields, a historian at Columbia? She's wrote a very famous essay yes. on race and racism. And at the end of it, she has a little comment about affirmative action. Her argument against affirmative action is that it reifies 
continues to make real in policy and in the culture possibly the worst, most pernicious idea in the history of the United States, which is that there are different races of people, different biological races of people, and that they are of different characteristics and that there's a hierarchy among them and some are more vulnerable than others, some are stronger than others, and some are weaker than others. It continues to reify, make real, in real policy, the worst idea America's ever had, race. Yeah, so I think that's, to me, that's the most damning argument against affirmative action. But I also think it contributes to pretty bad mental health among black students who are treated according to the well, principles I, of affirmative I, action. I see this claim from black student activists, which is when you read the demands that uh, different groups made all across the country, they were posted on one website. You can mm-hmm. read what they all were. One of the big demands is more mental health care yeah. for black students. And every time I see it, I wonder, like, are there different rates of mental illness among black students? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. But I see lots of black student groups asking for this. I, I, I get, I absolutely understand why a college campus would be a very uncomfortable place to be for a black student. Not all black students, but for some. Physically dangerous? No, that's ridiculous. But, but uh, psychologically uncomfortable mm-hmm. every single day? Oh, yeah, I completely get that. Uh So I'm very sympathetic to that. Connor, um, I think we've touched all the bases. (laughs) Uh, Home run, I guess. Uh, So, yeah, thank you for doing this. And uh, it was great. And I'd love to do this again sometime. Yeah, it was fun. Great to meet you. Thanks for doing this. All right, my pleasure. All right. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. If you like what you heard and want to keep this show going, please go to unregisteredlisteners.com and become a subscriber. If you would like to attend the upcoming special weekend event in Salem, Massachusetts, please go to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. Thanks for listening.